Well, hello there, and welcome to day 88 of A Film A Day with me, Jordan Woodley. And I decided after a couple of films that I've gone quite heavy on, had quite extensive films that have discussed quite heavy themes, I thought I would jump in back to my MCU retrospective early in the week to uh, give myself something a bit lighter and fun to uh, discuss. And we are now, what's this now, the fourth step in with Captain America, the first Avenger. Now, I have a funny uh, relationship with this one in particular. This was the first MCU film that I actually saw in the cinema. Unfortunately, I had a really bad time watching it. And I remember going away thinking I didn't really enjoy the film. I didn't hate it, but I didn't love it. But I just really was quite frustrated. Partly, and this is more on me than anything, it was during a phase when I inexplicably decided to try and watch some 3D films and get the 3D experience. Now, as I've discussed quite extensively on uh, in previous videos, I am severely visually impaired with two very different amounts of vision in each eye. And frankly, you don't even need to be severely visually impaired. You just have to have two different, um, two, two different fields of vision or, or, or uh, levels of perception in each eye to ha get no benefit from 3D because unfortunately it means you have no depth perception. But try I did. I, I don't really remember what the point of it was. And so consequently I ended up watching Captain America the First Avenger and I seem to remember the other one being Abraham Lincoln Vampire Hunter. In what I can only describe as a green tinted slightly headache inducing experience. But beyond that, I remember being a little frustrated with the film. And, and as I've mentioned before, this is during a period when I'd really stepped away from um, superhero films, practically almost entirely. Um, it was after The Dark Knight, which means, and that really revitalised me and made me go, oh, there is more value in these outside of being silly kids films, which... That was my perception at the time. Um, but I hadn't yet fully committed to um, the comic book genre in, in film terms. And then I came to see this. And the problem I had with this, as I think I've discussed before as well, war films are not a genre that I particularly have a great deal of passion for. There are exceptions where there are great war films that I genuinely admire beyond um, the genre. But the mechanics of the war genre is one that I think I struggle with the most. If not the most, it's up there as one of the genres I struggle with. Um, because I, And I can't fully put my finger on why. But there's just something about it that I find a little dull... I find the characterizations a little bit uninteresting and archetypal. And unfortunately, Captain America the First Avenger, you know, in, in this was the period where they were trying to experiment with genre. And, and, and okay, frankly, they've continued to do that. But this was a point in which they really wanted to say, let's make a Marvel film for each broad genre. So, so we've already had our fantasy with Thor. Um, and this was supposed to be the Marvel MCU's war film. But the struggle with this, and this is... It, you can start to see where they're, they're trying to create a, a structure, an MCU template. At least for the first couple of films. Um, primarily, they, the, the, the biggest thing they, they seem to have done in each one, and, and I've noticed this now is each of the original films has a really heavyweight actor in it, like a classically, um, you know, Hollywood um, mainstay. So, you know, I, uh, as I mentioned in the Thor uh, discussion, Anthony Hopkins really way, you know, holds down the Thor film. 
and really gives it gravitas in the places where it could be a little campy and and, and fant you know fantastical. Um, where you have Jeff Bridges in in the original Iron Man film, you know again really just gives this powerful performance of sort of which switches between uh, charismatic and friendly to sinister and dangerous in just a turn of a in the turn of a um the role of the die and in this one they try to do they have two not one but two different um you know classically hollywood actors to try and give it a bit more weight to it with um Tommy Lee Jones, who plays the Colonel, um, and Hugo Weaving, who plays the Red Skull. And both of them are genuinely great in this. They both genuinely give, you know, they do try to uplift the scenes they're in, particularly Hugo, Hugo Weaving. I genuinely think it's a shame that Hugo Weaving, for whatever reason, didn't have a good time working with this, and it's probably to do with the prosthetics and, um, you know, particularly towards the end of the film, when he fully embraces the Red Skull aspect, I imagine there is a lot of time he had to film, you know, with that extensive work done. And with the action sequences um, being the way they are, I could see, who, you know, perhaps that's the reason that he really didn't enjoy this and doesn't want to come back. But he really gives the Red Skull an authority and a villainy that, you know, frankly, could have made... Because, as I say, it all becomes a little archetypal and un, and unnuanced in places, you know. Um, and Hugo Weaving does give a textured performance that lifts a character like the Red Skull, who could just be generic, alternative Hitler stand-in. And... He really does try to, to make that character much more um, much more interesting and much more um, complicated as, as a villain. And, and Tommy Lee Jones, frankly, is just having fun. You know, there's something quite funny, but also, um, you know, he, he fits in that world so well. You know, he plays that militaristic leader so well that it just... You know, he, he, he sails through this and, and it's not a particularly difficult role for him. And as I say, so, so you have things like that in place where the MCU is trying to say, OK, we've got some proper serious actors in it. So people, you know, will, will appreciate, will acknowledge it. And we're going to really hit this genre from the ground running. I mean, this is directed by Joe Johnston, who, you know, previously had such a repertoire for... I mean, I mean, the things he's known for are things like, you know, Jumanji, Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, um, The Rocketeer. So, so, so that Rocketeer, obviously, having that World War II aesthetic to it. Um, and, and, of course, he'd worked, outside of directing, he'd worked extensively with George Lucas, you know, in The Raiders, um, in, the, in several Indiana Jones films, um, and Star Wars films. So he seems like the perfect candidate to be able to do the, you know, pulpy you know, World War II style, whilst also being able to meld in the more uh, science fiction -y elements to it. He, 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 on paper, seems like the perfect candidate for a director to carry a film like this and give it an authenticity. And, okay, so on the rewatch, I actually, I did enjoy it. I, I, I have to say, it did sail by quite comfortably. It's a fun watch. It's not a difficult watch. I think I just found... And it, it is competently done. All of the elements that I've mentioned give you a very competent film. But as I've said in other film, you know, in other reviews and analyses, competency sometimes can be a little... It's, it's not worse than a bad film, but when something is perfectly competently done, it can sometimes come across as just un, unengaging, where you go, yes, this is a film. <laughs> this is a well-made film. There's nothing broadly wrong with it. It is fine. But fine can be a little bit, I don't know, affecting sometimes when, when you're watching these. Um... So, I mean, I, the characters who, you know, the, the 
as we have the, the the old hand, you know, the newer mainstays of the MCU. You know, you've got your Chris Evans and your Sebastian Stans and your Hayley Atwells, who you know each bring a really good character. I mean, Chris Evans. You know, it's hard to appreciate the journey that he went on from this all the way till the end of Endgame. And, and of course, I'll be going through that journey on some degree. But seeing where he started, the thing that I don't remember appreciating when I first saw this was the fact that Chris Evans really is naturally just clicks into Captain America just so well. And he gives the character the right level of uh, conviction whilst also not making it campy and and uh, you could make the character of Captain America quite easily um, cornball and just a little bit saccharine in, in a way that would be quite hard to watch but he really does make that character likeable and also authoritative whilst also still going on a journey of discovering how he can be the best soldier he can be um and and uh, you know Sebastian Stan is a great Bucky and there's not much to say about him in this one because you know <laughs> that's a funny thing I suppose is when, if you were to watch this film in isolation and as I watched it at the time when it originally came out yeah he's he's a nice companion to Steve but He's actually one of the problems, and he, he sort of, he, he is a demonstration of what the problems are, which is his character barely has time to have the feet on the ground before some, there is a radical shift um, in his story, and, and for whatever reason, it, 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 the focus is completely taken off of him. So, and as I've said, I feel like I'm going to need to sort of discuss this quite thoroughly, because I will spoil most of this film, but... It's an MCU film, like, if it, if it boils down to watch it or don't watch it, I'd say watch it. But sort of to break down into the spoiler aspects of it, Sebastian Stan, you know, he's introduced, he's a friend of Steve's, he then goes to war, you then find out that he's been captured, Steve goes to rescue him now that he's got his Captain America powers, he comes back, he joins him in the Howling Commandos, he realises that their dynamic has been flipped, and now he's the slightly more, um, you know, Steve... Steve is the more uh, eye-catching one, and he's the sidekick, whereas their, their dynamic was sort of was flipped before that. And then he's killed, or seemingly killed. And the problem there is, and, and it's exactly the problem with the film, which is it so needs to get so much into the film that you don't get a chance to um, appreciate you know, moments like the fact that he gets rescued and then it's not that long between his initial rescue, a montage that's supposed to indicate a passage of time and then he is killed. So it almost undermines the rescue from earlier. I remember at the time, so many people unaware of, all of us unaware of what the MCU would become. The problem that, that what people said is this Captain America First Avenger film could have made up a trilogy of films practically because there's so much content which is rushed through. I mean, we have at least two, three montages in the film. And it's it's necessary because, you know, you have the, the training montage where he's, he's before he becomes Cap, the, the musical montage, and then the hero montage. But it, it does mean you feel a bit like you don't, you know, montages do rush you through things to get to plot beats. And that's really where the problem lies, where you're just going, okay, what's the next major set piece? What's the next montage to get to the next set piece? And we have moments, as I say, the chemistry between Chris Evans and Hayley Atwell is wonderful. And Hayley Atwell, as the third of the three, is a great um, Peggy Carter. She is, you know, genuinely just such a presence in the film that could easily have been lo generic love interest, but she is genuinely such a great um, foil for Steve. And, and, and she really fits in that, you know, in the films that we've seen so far, you know, you've got Hayley Ratwell as Peggy Carter, you've got Natalie Portman as Jane Foster, um, and you've had uh, Gwyneth Paltrow as 
as Pepper Potts, and they are great. They, the casting of the love interest has been great compared to the to, to, to the titular hero, because the female characters have their own personalities and agencies and roles within those narratives that are not just romantic. The only one of them that so far really I was disappointed by was um, The Incredible Hulk with Betty Ross, which was, well, as I mentioned, go back to the Invisible Incredible Hulk film for all the problems I had with that role. But yeah, so, so you have all these things in place. But as I say, it, it requires rushing through a lot to get Steve from small and weak. And it is one of those things where they really did try their best to convince us that Chris Evans was this puny, small guy. And they, it doesn't fail, but it's, there is something quite head-tilting about it, where you go, Chris Evans is like the tiny, weak guy who gets beaten up, and it doesn't always look... The effect work to make that happen doesn't always... hasn't aged entirely perfectly. Um, and then you get having this cap, and then you have him, you know, going through so much stuff before you have the climax so that he can be frozen and brought to modern day. And so much to try and cram into a film that really doesn't have time to breathe, and it somewhat struggles with that. And consequently, you know, it means that Hayley Atwell, Sebastian Stan, Hugo Weaving, Chris Evans, you know, all of them individually have have moments where they could be great, but they don't have enough real estate in the film to be better than that. And and mercifully for almost all of them, they've had chances to demonstrate that later on. So in, in Peggy's case with, with the Agent Carter series, you know, obviously the later uh, Cap films and, and Avengers films allow us to see more of Cap and Bucky. And of course the only one, which I say, Hugo Weaving as the Red Skull, I genuinely think it's a shame. And I know they were considering having uh, Robert Redford turn out to be the Red Skull in Winter Soldier, and I'm so glad they didn't do that. But it is a shame that we've never had the Red Skull return, and the way things have currently panned out, it looks like we'll not get a Captain America Red Skull confrontation again in that same way. Because this is very as I say, archetypal, it's a little bit standard. You know, their confrontations are a little bit underwhelming. And and that's a lot of the film. The action pieces are a little bit underwhelming. You know, the confrontation's underwhelming. And, and it's really only the performances that just make this more than a very bog-standard film. Um, at the moment, of course, we're now watching... Um, Falcon and the Winter Soldier, and we've now got um, Wyatt Russell playing uh, John... Ooh, what's his last name? John... Walker? Walker, who is the, quote-unquote, new Captain America. And, of course, it's funny because Wyatt Russell actually auditioned to play Captain America in this first Avengers film. Um, and it's quite interesting the way that we see the callbacks, like the thing where um, they say... I. I in the latest episode, um, Bucky says to uh, John Walker, he says, um, have you ever thrown yourself on a grenade? Of course, which calls back to a scene which I'd forgotten where uh, Cap jumps on a grenade. And it's, you know, and it really shows the work that now presently goes into the intertextuality of all of the MCU films and the TV series and everything to really create that connected tissue so that you feel like you're you know you feel like you've gone on this journey um but yeah I, I i enjoyed it and i think it's okay it's it like i say of the three launching heroes of the mcu this is the film which is probably the weakest of the three for me not because it's bad, but just because it's, as I say, it is competent. And unfortunately, there's not a great deal greater that I can, I can say about that. But knowing where it goes now, I'm glad it exists. Because again, it's a, found a foundation for what the MCU will be. And frankly, maybe doing a competent 
well-told cat film is all they wanted to achieve because there were two cat films that were previously made before this one um or two attempts at doing a captain america film one i think is in the 80s and one in the 90s if i remember rightly and they are both genuinely terrible like most of marvel films were back then they are genuinely genuinely terrible films respectively Each, both of them 80s and 90s one both are not good campy just awful films and the fact is this is not an awful film as i say it does everything perfectly well and steve chris evans really does give you a great steve rogers and i think frankly maybe that's all their goal was was to do a competent film and do it well and be able to go here is a captain america film that will last the test of time even if the effects don't age all necessarily that well but hey what what effects ever do so yeah we we have now reached that point where we are now one we, we're not even one away with the next film in the mcu rewatch will be the avengers um it might be a little while before we get to it but it's coming um but yeah I'm glad that I've taken this journey, this this sort of sub journey in my film watching journey because it's quite nice to again revisit these films and really get a sense get a sense of of where we've come from and where we're going in this respect. Anyway, thank you for joining me. Uh, if you could please uh, like the video, subscribe, hit that little bell so you get notifications when I upload new videos and comment. That's something else. Um, obviously, I want to engage uh, with you regarding, you know, thoughts on all the different films. Please do go through my back catalogue as well of all the films that I've covered. Um, and follow me on Twitter at Jordan underscore Woodley, where I'm posting all about films and links to new videos every day. Thanks for joining me. Take care.